Welcome to Design for the Creative Mind, a podcast for interior designers and creative entrepreneurs to run their business with purpose, efficiency, and passion. Because while every design is different, the process should remain the same. Prepare yourself for some good conversations with amazing guests, a dash of Jesus, and a touch of the woo-woo, and probably a swear word or two. If you're ready to stop trading your time for money and enjoy your interior design business, you are in the right place. I'm your host, Michelle Lynn. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the podcast. My name is Michelle Lynn, and I'm excited to introduce you today to a woman named Linda Holt. I'm sure a handful of our audience has heard of her. Linda is a Boston interior designer and photographer who teaches designers and home stagers to take stellar photos of their work using their, get this, your smartphone. So it is possible, and Linda is here to explain some of the details. Welcome, Linda. Thanks for being here. Oh, thank you so much, Michelle, for inviting me to come on today. I'm excited. Oh, my gosh. Well, I just think that <clears throat> what you do and what you teach is so important to the, to the masses of interior designers, home stagers, and individuals who are just looking to build our content. So let's, let's start with the beginning, where you... A designer or a photographer first? I was a photographer first. Growing up, I will literally say I was equal. I was the kid constantly rearranging the bedroom, you know, my little (laughs) eight by 10 room. But I also, from the time I was given my first camera on my 10th birthday, I always had a camera in my hand. And it was back and forth. I want to be a designer. I want to be a photographer. Literally my whole life. When it came time to go to college, I finally made my decision. I was going to go to interior design school. Went to my dad and said, dad, I'm going to apply to interior design school. He immediately shut it down and said, are you out of your mind? I am not paying for four years of college for you to go and learn how to pick out pillows for rich people. And that was the end of my dreams for interior design. So he told me I, he would only pay for college if I majored in business, education, or science. So my degree is actually in marine biology. What? <laughs> yes. So graduated <laughs> from college, worked in the field for a couple of years, went back to school, was miserable. I was working yeah. in a lab, went back to school on my own dime, this time for photography, because it was the Mm -hmm. only program I could afford. Um, So went to photography school for two-year photography Mm -hmm. program. And then I worked as a photographer for 25 years. I had a big studio in Boston. Oh, wow. And my niche was I photographed, um, I did commercial headshots. So that's actors, models, singers, Mm -hmm. celebrities. And that's Mm. what I did every day for 25 years. Then the big first recession hit of 2008. Yep. My business imploded. And at that point, honestly, after 25 years, Michelle, I had been so burned out. I said, okay, time to reinvent myself once again. Mm -hmm. I went back to school. Now I could afford it. I went back to design school. um, And that was in 2008. Opened up my business, Linda Holt Creative, in 2011 and was doing design. And, Mm -hmm. you know, so that's sort of how that whole evolution came. So how did you get involved in teaching smartphone photography? Because it is such a different, I mean, I'm picturing the, uh, the big cameras and yeah. the lenses and all yeah. the things. That oh, I'm yeah. To fish slip around. Oh, yeah. I had uh, all of that. Well, yeah. what actually happened was I knew nothing about smartphone photography. And I, you know, when I got my early smartphone, my early ones were um, iPhone mm-hmm. and my pictures looked like crap. And I was so frustrated and it was embarrassing. I couldn't post them or do anything with them. Here I was. Especially uh, with your background. Exactly. And everybody (laughs) knew it. So I just, I did what most people think about their smartphone. I thought of it as a crappy, you know, cell phone camera. And Mm -hmm. it was just, you know, if I had to take a quick point and shoot, they always were dark. They always were out of focus. They always were crooked. I didn't know any better. And then I honestly had kind of like a life-changing experience. I went to a seminar and this woman was teaching a, a course on Uh, how to get better photos using your smartphone. And on the projector behind her, when she was giving her talk, were like Mm -hmm. half a dozen magazine, shelter magazine covers. You know, it was Martha Stewart living and Coastal living. And the photos were amazing. And she told us she had done, taken every single one with her iPhone. 
And wow. I literally almost fell out of my chair and I came home. She never did tell us how to do it. All she did was brag about how great she can do it, but she never told us <laughs> how to do it. So, but the I idea came, was born. Exactly. And I came home and I started Googling, how do you get better photos with a smartphone? And I just, I spent a year and a half figuring it out. I finally you know, really mastered it. And it, it's not like the smartphone comes with an instruction booklet of how to take great photos. Right. And as my photos started to look really good, my friends would say, oh my God, that looks beautiful. How did you do that? I started telling them what I learned. And it just, everyone kept saying to me, oh my God, you should make a class. You should do a course. Everybody needs to know this. So during the pandemic, yeah. when I finally had some time to breathe, I sat down and I wrote a course specifically for interior designers, because there's a gazillion classes out there for the general public. But what mm -hmm. designers need to know, how do you photograph those darn window treatments when you have the light, you know, the backlight and, mm -hmm. you know, how do you photograph the furniture and those kind of things were not in the traditional courses or classes that I could find online. So that's, that's true. So you took your skill and your yes. education and yes. your previous life mm -hmm. and applied it to the current life and merged it with the smartphone. Exactly. And really what I say is I created the class that I wished I could have bought when I was trying to figure this out. Oh my gosh. That's exactly how I created my program for interior designers and the business of interior design. Oh my gosh. Where were we when we needed us? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And I wasted almost two years trying to figure out the darn camera. Right. I, because I was not an interior photographer. I was a headshot photographer. So not only did I have to learn how to use everything that the, all the hidden features and everything mm -hmm. about the camera, I didn't know how to shoot an interior. I didn't know what angles. I knew nothing, literally oh, nothing about interiors. Right, right, right. Because you were taking photographs of people and it was yes. just their headshots. It wasn't even lifestyle yes, in exactly. situations. And it's a totally different skill set, honestly, yeah, an interior photographer from a, from a portrait photographer. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Completely different. So let's let's just talk about your course a little bit right now. Mm -hmm. So tell us about the smartphone class. I'm, I'm my my curiosity is peaked. Yeah. So um, it's an online class, and I created a class. Whether you're an Android user, there's an Android version of my course and an iPhone version. Because Amazing. first I did the iPhone, and everyone's saying, "Oh, I want to do an Android." So I did an Android version, which is Samsung or Pixel. Those are the two I focus on. Mm -hmm. It's nine different modules, and each module has a series of short, bite-sized videos. So you could re really sit down every morning with your cup of coffee and watch a 10-minute video and work your way through. Um, once you purchase the course, you own it forever, so you can watch it whenever you want to. I update it at least once a year, and at, every time a new phone comes out, I do a whole new module on the latest phone. Oh, that makes sense because the things are technology is changing, always changing. And I will tell you, the the phones today, the new ones, they rival any DSLR camera I ever used in my life. They are amazing. They really That's are. Good to hear because I I agree that they're amazing, but I don't have anything to compare it to. Mm -hmm. Except for the filters. I love the filters. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So you're talking about the difference between interiors and just taking photos of everything. So I've taken really good pictures of my daughter. She's mm -hmm. super cute and easy to take mm -hmm. pictures of. Yeah. But what is the biggest mistake that designers make when they're photographing, when they're make when they're taking photographs with their smartphone? Like what what do we do wrong? Right. Well, there's two things that immediately come to mind. Number one, most people are holding their phone wrong. Most oh. people hold their phone up by their face, obviously. So they're looking at the back of the camera. And uh -huh. then what are they doing? They're tipping it down. Now, the problem with all smartphones is mm -hmm. the normal default lens, the lens mm -hmm. that when you open up your camera, that it opens up to is actually a wide angle lens. It's comparable to a 28 millimeter lens on a digital camera for people that work with digital cameras. Uh -huh. That's considered a wide angle lens. And with wide angle lenses, you're going to get perspective problems. In other words, your lines are going to bend inward or outward, similar to say, if you've ever seen a photo taken with a fisheye lens, the lines yes. do a big circle. Well, the wider the lens, the more the lines bend. And when you tip your phone down to take a photo, because it's up by your face, mm -hmm. all your lines in your image are going to start off wide at the top, and they're going to just bend inward at the bottom. So that's like the biggest mistake designers make, which is why their rooms oh. are always off in perspective. You really want to hold your phone on the same plane as what you're shooting, which if it's an interior, it's more down by your waist than so up by your face. So should you get down and kneel and take your I, photos from there? 
I do. I kneel. But huh. um, just getting down low, you know, and right. if you're tipping your phone down, you're going to get perspective problems. And also if you're tipping your phone up. So if you're shooting like high up on a window treatment or something, just mm-hmm. know you're going to get distortion. And that's when obviously if you can't get up and hold it on the same level, right. that's when you have to go in and do some editing in an editing app to fix that, those perspective lines. Oh, what a, that's interesting. So what are your thoughts on designers actually, I mean, because I'm blown away that you said those magazine covers, mm-hmm. because like I've always preached, get a professional photographer, but when do you think designers, since you are a designer, when should we take our own photos? I think when they become good enough. And I think that, you know, the luxury firms, they are not going to take the time because it's a lot of work taking your oh, own yeah. photos. Yeah. Um, the luxury firms, they have it in their budget, you know, that they can hire the professional. But for and they every, go with your stylist. And exactly. Do but for every one of those, there's a hundred designers out there who are doing a single room or they're just starting out, they don't have yes. the budget to hire a professional. And I don't know what it's like in Texas, but in Boston, minimum, we mm-hmm. started $3,000 a day for mm-hmm. a, uh, a hiring a professional. But the other thing that is almost equally as important, the copyright law today is a big big problem. And you take your own photos, you own the copyright. If you hire a professional, you do not own the copyright. And there are, I don't think a day goes by that I'm not hearing from a designer that they're being sued because they used a photo that they didn't take somewhere else. In fact, I currently have a friend who's being sued by her own photographer because she was chosen as designer of the month for an, for a, an, a company and they put her online and she you know shared some of her designs with this. Right. Company. They put them online. The photographer is suing her because he didn't give her permission to send those photos to this. I won't say who the company is, but you right. will have heard of it to send the photos to this company so they could use them online. So copyright did, is a big did issue. Did she credit him? I'm just curious. Did she give him credit in the photos? I honestly don't know that, but because what a, a what lot dude. of money for these photos. But another friend of mine, she took my course. She had the budget to hire a professional. Uh-huh. Um, the night before the photo shoot, she got a 11 page copyright contract with listing all the reasons, all the things she could and couldn't do with the photos. So she canceled the shoot and she did it herself. And you would not know they weren't taken by a professional. They came out great. Wow. Yeah. That just sounds like, you know, this, the photography industry is getting in their own way. It's, you, it's becoming that makes sense. a big problem. And honestly, you know, I'm speaking as a former professional photographer yeah. and they're scared. I, I, and they're going to say, oh, that's not true at all. But they are because the cameras, they are amazing. The new cameras do a great job. Yeah. And if you can learn the features of your camera, how to position and hold the camera, there's no reason why you can't do your own photography. But I think it's scary for a lot of people because they just have the mindset that, oh, I can't, my pictures are terrible. But that's well, really- yeah, they're terrible now, but go take your course and they're not right. going to suck as bad. Right. And then you practice right. a little bit and they're going to get good. Exactly. It's a little practice. You have to put the time in, but it will really pay off in the end. Oh, wow. And then it's so much easier to schedule. (laughs) And then you can use your photos however you want. You can tag vendors. And, you know, if you have a photo that you took and you want to Mm -hmm. tag the vendor, the products in your photo, you can tag them. You can't do that if you hire a professional unless you get specific permission that you can, you know, use them for a vendor. Or if a vendor says, I want to share your photo, right? that light that that you put in that room, if you share it and you didn't get permission from your photographer, you can be sued. So you have I, to be really, yeah. really careful today. That's interesting because I, thankfully, we've got a really good relationship with the photographers that we use, mm-hmm. but I do hear some of those stories or I read them on the forums and Facebook and stuff because I'm always yeah. scrolling those. Sure. But yeah, what a nightmare. So, so taking your own photos will just circumvent that entire hoops that you need to jump through. It is. And, and I just, it's obviously, it, like I said, it's not for everybody, but for the designer that doesn't have the budget, the designer that, you know, doesn't want to spend that account money because they just did a living room or, right. you know, they just did a couple of bathrooms in the house. It's not worth it to spend. They'd spend their whole profit on the job hiring a professional. Well, that, and I know when I'm talking to a lot of designers who are, they're just starting and they don't have much of a portfolio. Right. I'm like, 
grab your smartphone, right. put it on, you know, like the portfolio setting or whatever. Yeah. I'm no expert, but go take some pictures around your own house. Right. Exactly. That's all you need to do. But with your training, mm-hmm. they could take it past that and take it to a client's house. And like you said, if it's just one or two rooms and you don't necessarily need to hire a photographer for a bucket of money. Right. It's a great jumping off point. It is. And it's really a way to get started because at least they'll have good photos for their portfolio. Yeah, because that is so important. And that's like that chicken and the egg, which came first. Exactly. And also where the smartphone really shines is on the vignettes. Mm -hmm. You know, where it gets complicated is the big windows and the lighting and all that. Mm -hmm. But if you're shooting vignettes, the smartphone does an amazing job. Um, you would not know the difference between a, you know, hiring a professional and doing it yourself because the smartphone will do almost everything for you. You just need to learn how to use it. You were talking about hidden features. Mm-hmm. Are there just things that, I guess they're just hidden features that we oh, don't you- know exist for the photo. Fo- right. For the phones. Right. Like you can set the exposure manually, the focus manually. There's night mode. So if you're shooting a bathroom with no windows, an internal bathroom, you can put it into night mode. You will have to use a tripod because it could be like a, you know, five or six oh. second exposure. Um, there's burst mode. There's live mode. There are all of these features that people just think their camera is a point and shoot. And that's yeah. why they're not getting the results because they really don't know how to use it. But it's just like any tool. Mm-hmm, you have to exactly. be able to study it and, and and implement the details that go with it. Right. So I'm going to put you on the spot here. What are three mm-hmm. tips that you could share to immediately improve somebody's smartphone photos? Well, number one, we just talked about absolutely hold the phone on the same plane as what you're shooting. Mm-hmm. That way okay. it will minimize your lines and to help so you So either do- climb up on a step stool, kneel down, whatever you need to exactly. be doing in order to get in line. And to help you know that it is level, because sometimes it's kind of hard to tell, is mm-hmm. to turn on the in-camera grid. And to do that, if people don't know what that is, mm-hmm. you just go into settings, scroll down to you find camera, click mm-hmm. on camera, and then click on grid. And what the grid is, it's a series of horizontal and vertical lines that will show up on your camera screen. It won't be on your finished picture. And mm-hmm. you can line up something in your photo to the grid line that you know is horizontal or vertical, like a cabinetry or a windowsill or, you know, some dining kind of- table. Anything, anything. Back of a sofa. Exactly. And so the grid lines, if you're not lined up, you're not holding your phone level. So that's one little thing I would say. Number two, definitely get in the habit of setting the exposure and the focus manually. That's so important because when you're in an interior, and maybe people listening to this have experienced this, the interior will look dark. Yes. Why that happens is because the in-camera light meter is always going to expose for the brightest area. So if there's a window, it's going to want to expose for the outside light, which causes the inside to go dark. But Uh it's very easy to override that by setting the exposure manually. And you can do that depending what kind of phone you have, but it's Mm -hmm. very easy to do that. You can either tap anywhere on the camera screen, you know, in a corner, a dark corner or anywhere. Mm -hmm. And if you tap on the screen, that will tell the light meter to expose there, or you can tap and hold until a yellow box appears on the iPhone or a yellow circle appears on the Android. And if you slide your finger Up and down the screen on the iPhone, it will make it brighter or darker. And if you scroll it left to right on the Android, it will make it darker and lighter. Oh, interesting. I didn't know about the tap thing. So you tap in the corner and it just automatically goes to that. It, wherever you tap, that will tell the light meter expose here. So that's a real quick way to do it. If you're in a room and it looks dark and there's a bright area and a dark area, you want the dark area lighter, tap on the dark area. That's very cool. Okay. Or you can even like have more control by bringing up the box and the, or the circle. And with that, you have to hold your finger for a second or two until it comes off. I think comes I've up. done that in the past. I didn't realize that that was the, what do you call that? Manual? Manual, manually setting the exposure. It will override the in-camera light meter, which hmm. if you're out. Which is why it's a hidden feature because you have to literally put your finger there right. and hold it and then move it. And nobody knows about it unless they've talked to me or taken my class. Absolutely. Well, people do know no. about it, but a lot of people don't. I'm surprised at how many people don't. I always ask for a show of hands when I do a talk and maybe, you know, only 50% of the hands will go up of people that know mm-hmm. how to set, how to fix, you know, do the lighting. Well, that's probably because they heard you on a podcast or a, a presentation maybe. or something somewhere. <laughs> maybe we haven't done it, but we know it's right. there. 
Right. And then the last tip I would say is really learn a couple of in-camera editing apps. I do all my editing right on the phone, just a couple of seconds. You know, when you think about it, professionals would never, ever put a photo out there without editing it in some way. Pretty much every photo is going to need something. Maybe, Mm -hmm. you know, the lighting adjusted, the saturation, especially with an interior, maybe adjusting the perspective. But the camera in-camera editing app is great. There's also plenty of outside apps that are that are fabulous. So just get in the habit um, of using and getting familiar with a couple of editing apps just to take your photo over the line to great. So when you take that photo, you, mm-hmm. you take it from your phone album, mm-hmm. drop it into another app and do whatever that app does. And then do you save it back to your album and replace I do. the original? Yes. Um, you have a choice. Um, the, the app that I like, the general overall editing app that I use mm-hmm. is called Snapseed. It's very similar to the in-camera editing feature. There's just a few more things you can do with it. Um, mm-hmm. And I actually like Snapseed better. It's what I started on. I've been using it forever. But Snap, you're fast. I'm very fast. I do it in seconds. 30 seconds would be a long edit for me. But again, I've been doing it for years. Mm-hmm. But I will tell you, Michelle, my technical skill is that of like a four-year-old. So, and I learned this app in about 15 minutes. It's that user-friendly and that easy because when I was shooting professionally all those years back, first of all, there was no such thing as, I mean, I'm really dating myself, but there was film cameras. There was no computers. This was even before computers. So there was no Lightroom. There was no Photoshop. You had to send your finished prints out (laughs) to the retoucher. And the retoucher would do a process called airbrushing, where they would actually spray paint your images to like, in my case, it was reducing women's, you know, lines around their Uh eyes and cleaning up men's beard lines. And, and it would take weeks and it was really, really expensive. So for me to be able to edit a photo on my phone, it's like I have died and gone to heaven. What could be easier? And I always struggled once, once I did get into, you know, we had computers. So we evolved from airbrushing onto online Photoshop. Right. It's a huge learning curve. I struggled with it. I actually ended up paying somebody to do it because again, a four-year-old couldn't do it. I can't do it. But I can do the phone editing apps, especially Snapseed or the in-camera app. It, they're so easy. Well, that and it makes sense because once you do it and you master, you master it and you keep doing it over and over and over again, you just keep getting better and better and faster and faster. Yep, exactly. It's oh, like, and I do it while I'm that. watching TV. I mean, it's just whenever I can be standing in the line at the grocery store yeah. and have you know, a long line, oh, I pull up a photo and do a few edits on it and Again, and then you're good just, to go. Exactly. So are you available for hire? Do you As, do photographs for other people? or do Well, you, it's do funny you ask that? that because I generally would say no, but I have three different designer friends who have begged me to help them. So I actually oh, am yay. going to do my third photo shoot um, on Saturday of my friend's project, um, mainly because I'm, I'm doing it for free because I always mm-hmm. am wanting to get more material for my mm-hmm. course. And the biggest part of my course is interior photography. I have yes. five, five modules on that, uh, five videos under that module of interior photography. And I always want to keep it fresh. So, mm-hmm. and every situation is different. So this home seems a little more complicated. Um, it's just one room that I'm going to be shooting for her mm-hmm. on Saturday, but I want her to videotape me shooting it with my smartphone. So people can actually say, oh, Oh, so yes. that's what she did. That's where the their camera is. That's how she did this. That was her positioning. Because you can say, talk, you know, show photos. Well, this mm-hmm. is what I did. But people want to see, at least yes. I do, not just tell me how to do it. Show me what you did to get that result. But so, if you think about it, if a picture is worth a thousand words, a video is worth a bajillion. Right. Especially right. when it comes to talking about photos. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> that's genius, Linda. Yeah. And that's going to be great to add into your content. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I've done one already. So this will be the second. Who knows? Maybe you're reinventing yourself again. I know. I'm not out. I'm not getting back into <laughs> photography, but I love it. I mean, for me, it's the perfect combination of my two loves, yes. photography and interior design. That is, And isn't that the best when you find that lane that you know you're supposed to be in? It's so funny. I think about it all the time, Michelle. You know, yeah. I started off and I wanted to do both. And then I chose one. My father shut me down. Mm-hmm. Then I went back and did one that I could afford. And then 
I was 50 when I went back to school for interior design. Uh And finally, now I really honestly feel I have come 100% full circle in my life. Yep. And you're 10 years old again. Yep. I'm decorating my room and (laughs) carrying my camera around. (laughs) And that is also something just to go down a bunny trail is like for our listeners, you're never too old. Exactly. And I tell that my son is 30 and he's always mm-hmm. bemoaning, oh, I should have done this, should not. I'm like, listen, and I always use myself as an as an example. Look at me. I'm mm-hmm. old and I'm, doing, I, I'm reinventing myself all the time. It's a mindset. It's totally, it's totally a mindset. A mindset. I don't know if you know this, but I adopted my my daughter when she was a newborn and I was 48. Mm -hmm. I did not know that. So it's just like, you know what? Here's the deal. If your mind is willing, everything else will line up and the universe will conspire to make you successful. It's true. And it's too bad that, you know, I definitely with age comes wisdom. And Mm -hmm. I I had so many mindset issues when I was younger. So many blocks. I can't do that. You know, and getting older, I have become more fearless <laughs> with every year. Yeah, so like, I'm thinking that I'm when gonna I'm 90, anyway. I'm going to be I'm gonna be <laughs> dancing on TikTok when I'm 90. I don't know. I just feel like what the hell life is short. Mm-hmm. So I'm just, I just go for it. And, but it took me into my fifties, honestly, to have this mindset yeah. because I did not. Well, hopefully somebody listening will hear us speaking mm-hmm. Right. And we'll hopefully like expedite their learning curve. Right. Like let's shorten that learning curve for the people following behind us. Sure. If you want to go back to school and, and you know, for interior design and you're in your 40s, I'm going to say you're a baby, you know, yeah. do it. You could do it in your 60s. You can mm-hmm. do it whenever you want to. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So going back to your course, you mm-hmm. said that you've got a few modules that are like five modules that are for interiors. Mm-hmm. What about like, are the other ones like, photographing yourself. I have like, portraits. The, I can go through real quickly if I can remember. So I have composition, uh-huh. lighting, mm-hmm. um, interior photography. Mm-hmm. I have selfies and portraits. Mm-hmm. I have tabletop. I have window treatments uh-huh. and I have, um, okay. So now I'm, I'm d- drawing a blank here. That's a um, lot though. Yeah. Yes. It covers quite a bit, but there are nine different, different topics. But again, all focused on interior designers. So, mm-hmm. oh, when I'm talking about like trade, like um, like trade shows, it's really hard to shoot at trade shows. So yeah. I talk and shooting at show houses. So mm-hmm. that is one shooting at show houses and trade show. So they are so ge- you know sort of keyed into what a designer needs to know. Well, and when should we shoot ourselves? Like you were talking about selfies and, yep. and stuff like that. When should we shoot ourselves and when should we hire somebody to do it? Well, that's a little bit tricky question because it depends again, like, like I shoot myself, but I've just uh-huh. recently started shooting myself. Mm-hmm. I think I would probably defer to a professional, especially for your portfolio. I mean, your website and your brand photos, mm-hmm. you don't want to be worrying about setting the timer and running back in place and, you know, doing all that. So I yeah. would definitely use a professional for that. But, you know, the reason why I did is how often are we at like, I just got back from High Point Market. I must have had my photo taken or, you know, done the selfie thing 50 times in the yeah. five days I was there. So, again, I want to just we're posting that on on Instagram and on it's Facebook. Part of, it becomes part of our brand. It does. And if they're crappy photos and we all have raccoon eyes, we don't mm-hmm. want to see that up up on social media. So I right. have a whole thing about how to do how to quick tips for photographing at, at trade shows and, and for selfies and things like that. Oh, that's amazing. So yeah, that's, and I love the fact because it's true. So we can take beautiful photos of the interiors, mm-hmm. but then if our selfies and our other photos mm-hmm. are crap that are just on our stories, it, it kind of, they, they argue with each other. Right. And also I found that with, um, you know, they say like Instagram, people have really upped their game. There are yes. not a lot of crappy photos on Instagram. They are beautiful photos. Mm-hmm. And I've even noticed people well, are upping their game. you haven't been on my profile lately, have you? <laughs> no. I've even noticed in stories where it used to be, oh, stories would be the place you would have not edit anything, just throw it up there. Yes. Even on stories, people are getting posting great Mm -hmm. photos in their stories. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Although I will say, thankfully, there are those 
aforementioned filters. Yes. Oh, <laughs> that, yes. That take a little bit of the work yes. out of those selfies. <laughs> yes, exactly. It's like the Zoom filter. I have that baby turned all the way up to 100%. <laughs> this is Zoom filter? Hold on. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I didn't know that. Yes, there's a Zoom filter. It's called the appearance filter. Oh, and, I'm going to have to find that. Oh, yeah. It's in it's in settings, and mine is all the way up to 100%. <laughs> if it go to 1,000, I would put it up That's there. That's amazing. I'm going to check that out in just a little bit. Yeah, because um, you guys can't see, but I'm actually in this yellow orange room at a, a co working space because my internet went out at home. So <laughs> I really need the filter today, Linda. Thankfully, this is just audio. Yes. <laughs> oh, goodness. I love what you're doing. Thank you. I'm Absolutely. loving it too. I'm really, I am so passionate about empowering designers because I honestly think they've kind of been, you know, kind of sold a, a bill of goods that isn't true where, oh, you can, you oh have to hire a professional. You have to, you have yeah. to, you do not have to, but you have to have great photos. So if you mm -hmm. don't want to take the time to learn it yourself, then yes, you have to hire the professional. But if you're willing to invest a little bit in time and money, mm -hmm. you would not, you will not have to hire a professional again. Or another tip is hire the professional for what I call the money shot, hire them for that big mm -hmm. room with a window light coming in and they want to see the ocean in the background, but all the furniture needs to be in, in view. Okay. That is definitely very complicated because it's multiple shots and it's editing and um, sandwiching them in to making one photo, hire the professional for the really difficult shot, mm -hmm. then send them home. Just say, I want you for, you know, one shot. You can do all the vignettes because remember that is where the cell phone really shines is with the vignettes. Mm -hmm. And the client's while they want to see those large photos, mm -hmm. you're going to still have a lot more content when you're going through and taking those smaller vignettes. And you can also show the level of detail yes. that is put into your design. So I think if you start looking for reasons why it works, you'll find a lot. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Well, Linda... I love talking business and I get, I get so excited, especially about empowering the, the our industry. But in the interest of time for our audience, I want to switch into our next segment, which is our rapid fire Q&A session, <laughs> which is just nothing's off the table. And our audience gets to know you just a little bit better on a okay. different level. <laughs> oh, God, this is the scary part. Okay. <laughs> well, we will start off easy. What is your favorite flavor of ice cream? Oh, God. Gosh, that is a tough one. I'm easier probably to say, what don't you like? Because I like all ice cream. Uh, uh, one kind uh, I don't like. I guess if I had to pick my favorite favorite, uh -huh. uh, mocha chip. Oh, yum. Yum, yum, yum. Okay. What is the best compliment you have ever received? Um, your kids are great. Oh, I love that. When was the last time you laughed until you almost peed yourself? Oh, my gosh. Um <laughs> I would say about a month ago when I had lunch with a friend and we, I thought we were going to be thrown out of the restaurant. We were laughing so hard about something. Uh, those are always good ones. <laughs> uh, what is your favorite productivity hack? Um, I use an email filter called Sane, um, Sane, it's a Sane Box. And it divides my emails into uh -huh. like important ones, later news, blogs, and I can filter them out. So I used to get like hundreds and hundreds of emails today, a day. Now yes. I get like five or six emails a day. Oh, I am going to go check that out. It's I called it down. Sane Box. That's my Amen. favorite, favorite. Because email for me was a struggle. I was always missing important emails. I was flooded with spam. Mm -hmm. And they have something called um, Black Box. So uh -huh. if you get an email and you don't want to go through the hassle of unsubscribing, put it in Black Box, you'll never get it again. And no one will know you've unsubscribed. So if you have some vendor yeah. that you don't want to offend by unsubscribing or, or a friend who publishes a blog that you never read, yeah. slip it into black hole and they'll never know. Oh, amazing. <laughs> I'm totally going to check that out. <laughs> okay. If you could have one superpower, what would it be? Oh, superpower. Um, being able to speak every language that there is. Because I love to travel cool. and I want to be able to talk to everybody when I go places. So mm -hmm. it would be at least knowing 10 languages. That would be amazing. Can you imagine the efficiency you could travel? Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. Any belly button or Audi? Uh, any. And what, <laughs> <laughs> what is your biggest pet peeve? Uh, corner fireplaces. <laughs> and I have one to make it even worse. <laughs> yes, that's perfect for this audience. <laughs> um, where do you find inspiration? 
travel and nature. There you go. I'm going back to your 10 languages. Yep. Okay. What would you say is, has, bleh, excuse me, has been your biggest failure and what did you learn from the experience? Um, my biggest failure. I'm trying to think of something recent. Well, mm-hmm. maybe um, not that long ago, a year ago, I decided to do a different way of introducing my class and I did this big live launch. Mm -hmm. And it was a failure. For me, it was a failure. I didn't sell nearly as much as I wanted. Went back to the drawing board, started all over again and relaunched and then had a successful one. But for me, that one that I put so much time into, it was Mm -hmm. just did not work. Interesting. 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 Yeah. And you learned just what your audience needs. Yep. Yep, exactly. Well, and that goes back to, you You can't be, uh, I don't think we talked about this today, but you can't be all things to all people. You have to honor exactly your own lane and right. you will attract the people that understand and, re- and, and relate to it. Yep, exactly. And that is... Um, you know, I, I listened to people that I shouldn't have listened to and they, well, what I actually did was I created a, a general public photography class for a, Mm -hmm. just, and I shouldn't have, I knew I needed to just stay with designers, but I had several clients and Mm -hmm. friends say, Oh, I, I don't, I'm not a designer, but I really would love to take your class. I created the class and it was a huge amount of work, a huge amount of time. And I I had this big launch and I sold three. (laughs) <laughs> wah, wah, wah. I know exactly. So that was it. I I still have it. I've mm-hmm. not promoted it since, and I've gone all in and just really focused on making my my signature course for designers and stagers the best it can be. And yeah, I'm always tweaking that and just there's there's go buy somebody else's photography class. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Either that or buy it and just ignore those other five modules. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So last one is. Actually, two more. What is your favorite book? Oh, um, I just read a book that I loved, and it was called um, The Big Leap. And that really resonated with me. Um, I can't think offhand. It's not Simon's. Yes. No, no, it's not him. No. Okay. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Gay Hendrickson, I think it is. Okay. And I really resonated with this thought of you hit these plateaus Mm -hmm. and you self sabotage, and you really have to like get through that to get to the next level. And I have found that in my life. I, Mm -hmm. you know, when things don't go well, I, I, I just, I resonated with, with the book. So that's the big leap. Yeah. I really liked that a lot. I have seen that. I might even have it on my list. I might just have to hit it, put it in the cart. Yeah. I like that by. one a lot. Yep. Okay. Good to know. So the last, last question yeah. is if you could have dinner with anybody past or present, who would you invite? Diane Fossey. I know that's a weird one, but I'm a nature lover and I would love to talk to her. She's the woman that she's the one that goes to the in the, um, the rainforest apes, apes in the mist. She studied the apes. She lived in the rainforest for 40 years and studied the um, the apes in Africa. Oh, that would be an interesting conversation. What do you think you would serve? I don't know. I'm just a sign. Oh, what I would serve. What would you um, serve for dinner? I don't I know, know. That's a random question. Yeah, I don't know. That's not she, even on my list. She might. She. <laughs> I don't. She might be a vegetarian. I think I read that somewhere about her. Uh-huh. So I don't know. Something. Yeah. something. That would be an interesting conversation, though. But I've, I've always admired her a lot um, because mm-hmm. she was really pioneered. Um, she was like the, the pioneered the whole idea of conservationalism with, a, with the animals. And I am a, you know, science geek, nature lover, mm-hmm. love animals, love all and certainly love uh, conservation. So I right. just think it would be fascinating to talk to her. Agreed, especially as a woman to a woman. Totally off, off. I know, totally yeah. like, what? <laughs> oh, no, that's, a, that's one of those random questions. Like, yeah. Who would you invite? You know, there's like, <laughs> she just popped in my head. I don't know. There's a million people I'd love to have dinner yeah. with. It would just be one big party. Yeah, Oprah. I'd love to have dinner with Oprah. She'd be fun. Or she would be whatever. inspirational. Yeah. Well, Linda, I know that our audience has loved everything you've had to say and are probably interested in your course. So tell us how we can follow you, how we can find you, how we can connect with you. Sure. So I am Linda Holt Creative pretty much everywhere out there on the internet. So if you type in Linda Holt Creative, that's what I am on Instagram. That's what I am on Facebook. That's my website. That's my my email. It's everything. And one thing I can offer your um, listeners that might be interested is I have a free ebook download and they can grab it either off my website or in my bio in my Instagram. And it's um, five tips for magazine worthy interior 
photos and oh, it's perfect. five different things that they can do to, you know, to tackle their interior photography. And it's free. I love that. I so think they that can, is such a great resource. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to go download it myself probably. Great. Yeah. Fun, fun, fun. Well, thank you. I will make sure that all of that information is listed in our show notes. Absolutely. And I'm looking forward to how we can connect again in the future. Great. I would love to. And my course too is also, you know, on my website and in my bio and and all that. So all the things I'm really easy to reach. People DM (laughs) me all the time. I'm the person that responds like immediately. Um, I don't have a staff. So if you DM me, it's me responding to you. I love that. That is so important too. It's just, that's why it's called social media because it should be personal. Exactly. I have a just quick, funny story. I'll tell you, I hired a 23 year old social media whiz kid back in the pandemic. And he would, I, I did a Dropbox of photos and then he was going to write the captions. I'd go through, read them and approve them. Mm-hmm. Oh my God, Michelle, it was hilarious. The things that he <laughs> thought uh, an, an older woman would say, but the one that took the cake was one day he wrote, I'm balling my interior design photography. I had to look up the word balling. I'm like, what the? I thought it was something obscene. It just did not work out. So to this day, my husband goes, you're going to go balling your interior design work today? So I realized after that, I have to do this myself. I can't have someone else. That is greatness. So I will say, admittedly, I... I've had one, two, three different firms who were doing my social media. I finally found one that can capture my voice. I don't say ballin, you know, but (laughs) I do have a quirky voice and so forth. And it has just been as much as I love social media, I had to practice what I preach. Mm -hmm. I don't make money posting social no, media. I, I make know, money that's true. running my business and designing yes. and stuff like that. But I yep. do, I answer my DMs because I yeah. just think that's so much more fun. Yes, I agree. All right. So for those of you in the audience who can benefit from even more resources surrounding the business of running your interior design business, join the growing community on my Facebook private group. It's called the Interior Designers Business Launchpad. And I know I make fun of it too. It's Facebook, but it is the best place to have a private group. We are very active very supportive. I go live training weekly and we have some amazing workshops and speakers and stuff like that in there. So come join me, Interior Designers Business Launchpad. So Linda, thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Michelle. This was a blast. I loved it. Thank you so much for inviting me. We will catch up with you guys soon. Hey, y'all. If you love the show and find it useful, I would really appreciate it if you would share with your friends and followers. And if you like what you're hearing, want to put a face with a name and get even more business advice, then join me in my Facebook group, the Interior Designers Business Launchpad. Yeah, I know it's Facebook, but just come on in for the training and then leave without scrolling your feed. It's fun. I promise you'll enjoy it. And finally, I hear it's good for business to get ratings on your podcasts. So please drop yours on whatever platform you use to listen to this. We're all about community over competition. So let's work on elevating our industry one designer at a time. See you next time.